My name is Victor D. Freudenberger, spelled F-R-E-U-D-E-N-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E 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 My age is 94. So how did you come about joining the military? Um, what branch were you in, or were you in a special unit? Can you tell me about that? Yes, well, after I finished high school in 1938, we were in the midst of the Depression, and even though I did have a job uh, working as a roofer, uh, it wasn't the uh, most pleasant thing when you would get burned with hot tar on your back. So I decided I, I was always fascinated by the Marine Corps. I'd read several stories and uh, two stories about uh, other Marines. So I finally decided, well, I think I'll just become a Marine. So I walked in and, and uh, signed up and I was on my way for... And this was in September of 1938. I was 18 years old. So I went through boot camp, Paris Island, South Carolina. That's where the East Coast people go. And then after that, I went aboard a sh ship uh, as a Marine detachment on the ship. And uh, on a cruiser, it was a brand new cruiser. And uh, even though I, it's interesting enough, I uh, didn't mention where I was born, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the ship was being commissioned in Philadelphia. So, so in early 39, uh, our detachment, we formed a new detachment. And uh, interesting, I, I, I was appointed as a, as a captain's orderly. And uh, for some reason, I was the first one and the ship was commissioned. I was served the first duty as captain's orderly. And so, uh, I was on the ship for over two years. I won't go into a lot of details. We traveled, uh, uh, one time we went all the way to South America and stayed there for four months for as a show of strength. I won't go into all the details about it, but it was when the Graf Spey Navy battleship was sunk in uh, and next to Uruguay. Uruguay had no, no army at all and right across the way was Argentina, which was pro, pro uh, Marine Corps, I mean pro, pro German. So um, they became quite frightened when they found certain things were happening. And uh, so they asked uh, President Roosevelt to have some show of strength. And we were two, uh, two cruisers and they doubled the strength of the Marines from 45 each to 100 each. So we had 200 Marines and we steamed down there and, and stayed in that area back and forth and all up and down. And of course it was great to, for us because the English were already at war and everywhere we went, the English had wine and diners, parties and so forth. So it was very memorable and really enjoyed that. And so then <clears throat> after I was on board ship for two years, the Marine Corps decided they were gonna have parachutists. So uh, I volunteered to become a parachutist and uh, you had to be 21 at that time you had to have two at least 21 had to have <laughs> two years in the Marine Corps and uh, pass almost the same as a flight physical so anyway I went through the third class that was in Lakehurst New Jersey which again is fairly close to Philadelphia that's a uh, a, bl a blimp station you know where the uh, dirigibles are it's where the grass where the Hindenburg blew up that was Lake Hirsch, New Jersey. So um, after that, then I joined the 1st Parachute Battalion and that down in, in, in the New River, North Carolina, where the forming, the forming of the 1st Marine Division the first time. And so, uh, of course, when the war came along, naturally we figured we'd be going right away, but it wasn't until uh, later, quite a bit later, before the, uh, the division uh, was, was leaving and going. So uh, I won't go into all details getting there, but we went to New Zealand and then offloaded and reloaded and went up to the Solomon Islands. The main island is Guadalcanal. And this is where the Japanese already were there and uh, were building an airfield. And so uh, that's why it was a hurry up for us to get there because if the airfield had been completed, they would have been able to bomb both Australia and New Zealand. And so we went to stay. It was the first real offensive action against the Japanese 
in World War II. Even though we were in a parachute battalion, we knew we were, they weren't going to be ha having planes drop in Guadalcanal, but of course, our colonel definitely said we wanted to be part of it. And so um, the initial landing was a complete surprise, and the, the troops, the Japanese on Guadalcanal, went into the jungles and hid, and so there was no real offensive action the first day. That was in the morning. But there were two small islands called Gavutu and Tanambogo, quite small, and uh, they, they, they picked it, we would attack them, them. And our battalion was only 400 men, it was a small battalion. But of course, in the difference between 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock at noon, they were already dug in, there was no surprise. So when we landed, it was quite, it was pretty rough because they were well dug in and they're in caves and crossfire. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the first two days we had 40 killed and uh, I was wounded also. and. Uh, and a few days later, there was a big battle where the Japanese had snuck in at night and sunk several of our cruisers and, and uh, destroyers. And so the Navy then pulled out. And uh, in a way, I was very fortunate because when the Navy pulled out, uh, I went to, back to New Zealand where they had a Navy hospital, brand new. So we were some of the first casualties of the, of the hospital. And so we stayed there and recovered, and it wasn't life-threatening, but it was, I had lots of fragments in, in my legs and uh, had to be removed and lodged in the bone. So uh, <clears throat> by that time, uh, the rest of the battalion in Guadalcanal had been relieved because they'd been in several battles. And they were on a small island called New Caledonia. It's a French island, Numia, New Caledonia. And so we were reforming the battalion there. And uh, so uh, uh, shortly after that, the uh, colonel called us in and said, well, I have orders to make, we were all sergeants at that time, just about all the ones who were there, and um, said, we have uh, uh, authority to give, make 20 of you uh, second lieutenants and 20 to send you back to be instructors at parachute school. So my friend and I sat there and he said, I just, ha just for fun, why don't you tell me how many would like to go back? And of course, he and I put our arm up. It turned out that 20 volunteered. <laughs> the other 20, of course, were appointed second lieutenants and would stay there for several more battles. So to make a long story short, I went back as instructor. And, uh, <clears throat> and later in 43, uh, the Marine Corps decided that they were going to disband the parachutists. By that time, there were four battalions and also the raiders, which were both specialists. And they were going to form a fifth division, and they would be a, the, the two regiments of the fifth division. So the colonel who uh, was at the school called us in and said, uh, you have months, three, four months before the disband. So if anybody wants to be transferred somewhere else, I'm telling you what you will be. You'll be forming another division, obviously. So if you have a specialty someplace you want to go, I will approve it, recommend it. So it so happened I was already qualified in demolitions, and I was kind of fascinated by explosions and doing that sort of thing. So I volunteered for ordnance school, and I went to the ordnance school and went to the ammunition section. And, and uh, in the meantime, I uh, met my wife in Philadelphia, and. Four months later, we were married, <laughs> and uh, I was thinking I'd be going overseas right after the, when I finished the school, which would be April of 44. And, uh, but in the meantime, uh, well, anyway, when uh, I was retained as an instructor there, so that made it fine because then my wife came down and we were living in Quantico, Virginia, where the Marine Corps schools are. And so there, that was April, and uh, in October, of 44, then I was appointed warrant officer, which is a special, uh, especially it's an officer, but it's not commissioned, it's a warrant officer. It's a respected rank because you have to be a, as a very special specialist. And so, uh, of course, then I knew I'd be going overseas again. And so uh, I went over to Guam and uh, I wasn't in the, there were no vac vacancies in the ammunition. 
or the EOD, or bomb disposal. So I became a, an office, a, a, a ordinance officer for a 155 gun battalion. That's the big guns, long toms. And so uh, I was with them for about well, six, seven months, and we were already forming and actually getting ready to load for the invasion of Japan, which was going to be, you know, it was going to be in October of 45. So when bombs were dropped, that was real. <laughs> it saved many, many, many lives. I could make a whole story about that alone. But so, um, so then I was transferred back to Hawaii, and, uh, and my wife came out and there for a while, and then we went back and uh, went back to the States because I'd already been overseas a second time over a year and a half. And, and so I went back to ordinance school where I was instructor again for, for three years. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and then I uh, also went to the Navy EOD, which is Explosives Ordnance Disposal, which is disposing of all types of weapons, you know, dogs and all that. So uh, I was fully qualified then to do that, and uh, then I joined the, uh, then came and joined the, the first Marine Division, and uh, and I was only there about four months is when June when the Korean War started. So uh, my title then was I was the executive officer of the ammunition company, and division ordnance officer or EOD officer, and so. Uh, <clears throat> When we loaded to, um, well, I won't get into all the details about the loading, but anyway, we uh, part of the division went to uh, Korea quickly. They really needed it, otherwise they would have lost Korea completely. And the brigade went, which was a regiment fully supported, and that's like a third of the division. And the rest of the division followed, and uh, when we, uh, uh, we went into Kobe, and at that point, uh, lots of the ammunition was on in individual, uh, not Navy ships, but uh, commercial ships. And so the job that had to be done was to unload and reload all the ammunition as five units of fire, which a unit of fire is enough to be in complete warfare of 24 hours. And that's a lot of ammunition. One unit of fire is about uh, let's see, 250 tons, <laughs> and so, uh, so we had five units of fire. It had had to be unloaded off the ships, s segregated, and put back on the, the ships. Which, in other words, infantry had their small arms, their grenades, and bazookas, all that sort of thing. And then, of course, the artillery had the big shells. Tankers had the tanks, and so on. You know that if you didn't have the ammunition with you when you landed, you wouldn't be in a fighting position. But the critical part was that the landing at Injon was set as a definite date. It had, couldn't be changed because I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but Injon has one of the highest tides in the world, 31-foot tides, which is, means a lot when you're taking ships in and out. So. Uh, we knew how much time we had to do this, and uh, it was going to be a, a tough job to get all this unloaded and reloaded. And then about the second day we were there, they had a hurricane, and uh, that stopped everything. And a couple of the ships, two of the uh, civilian ships, actually caught fire, and uh, some of the ammunition was destroyed in that fire. So, uh, so then we were working just, uh, it was my responsibility, a complete to get it done. My commanding officer, who was uh, the captain, I was a lieutenant at the time of the ammunition company, was, uh, he was in Tokyo with the headquarters and, you know, doing all the planning work. So uh, it was my full responsibility to get that done. And then with two days cut off, made it very, very critical. So we were working eight hours on, eight hours off. And, uh, so we proceeded, and one of the things made it slower, that the way when the ammunition was unloaded from the ship, it went on these Japanese uh, sampans where the families live on them, you know, have their own little fire and everything. So that in itself wasn't the safest thing. But they were very difficult to load and unload because they were just deep 
wooden hull, uh, very old, old ships. So that slowed down the procedure. So to make a long story short, uh, when the time came, the last day, oh, I forgot to mention, in the fire of the one ship, the primers, I'm going to on, on separate loading ammunition, artillery, there's a projectile, there's a, the, uh, the, the propellant, these are all separate, and the primer. Well, the primers, you need them, but without that you can't, you can't detonate, you can't fire. And so the primers were destroyed in that ship. And so they were being flown from the States. The day, the very last day when they're pulling out, the artillery battalions had already started in their LSTs, it's a slow ship, and uh, they went first. And so I had a Navy speedboat waiting for me. The primers arrived. I drove, speeded up about three hours to catch up with the prime for the artillery. So they had the, their artillery when they landed, you know, they could fire. And so that was so frustrating. I mean, talk about pressure. I really couldn't sleep more than a couple hours at a time. So when I got back to my ship, I went to sleep and I slept for 24 hours straight. <laughs> and that was, I think, one of the most stressful things as far as I was concerned, you know, aside from being in combat, it was something that if they didn't have the ammunition, what good are they? So, so it was a very critical thing, but it worked out. You know, uh, and then I, as soon as I, we landed, then I became uh, EOD officer, bomb disposal full time. I had a squad, and our job was to, to uh, whenever d duds were located, we would dispose of them, blow them up, and and also the enemy ammunition that was left, we would gather that, and and so we were busy, busy all the time, and uh, and of course it was, you know, it was dangerous, but I mean we pretty well knew what we were doing, and uh, we did run into some booby traps and things like that. But um, I was there for 10 months and uh, of course went all the way through six major battles, one of course being the Chosen Reservoir. And uh, I was always up as far as you could go to with the infantry because that's the ammunition battalion or the ammunition platoon which supported the infantry and all were always right behind the the forces, so that's where I was always right up there and closer to get to the duds. And so, um, uh, anyway, we uh, uh, we did that and uh, uh, when, the, uh, when we got to the Chosen, of course, I guess most people know what happened. We had like 120,000 Chinese surrounding us, 30 bullies zero, and uh, on a, about 5,000 square feet, um, five, um, no, no, no. Uh, up in the mountain is one way road, and not 5,000, but I think it was about 2,000 feet. But it was very cold. It got down to 30 below zero, and with a, that didn't include wind factor coming off of the, from, from China. And so uh, it was very stressful because it's not just fighting the, China, the Chinese, but just uh, surviving the weather because lots of people got frostbite. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, fortunately, uh, I was part where we had a, a warming tent. But the fact that Marines, uh, of course, we were shorthanded, had a lot of casualties, and every Marine was a rifleman. That's where they differs from the Army and the other services. Uh, every year, all the, every man in the Marine Corps, right up through Lieutenant Colonel, qualifies, requalifies with a rifle and pistol two weeks training every year. And that makes them special because then every, every Marine is a rifleman. Or the Army, if you have a tuck driver or cook, they're, they're not ready to go on the line and, and be accurate. So uh, the Marine pride themselves with being very accurate and, and can do a lot with their rifles. So uh, that's what helped survive, helped us survive because every one of us would be on the line at night because that's when the Chinese would attack, of course. So you'd work all day and you'd be on line night. Well, after three, four days of that, you know, you finally get to a point where you need some sleep. And uh, one incident, which is kind of interesting, how you become just sort of indoctrinated. Uh, I came into the tent and I said, now look, fellows, I need four or five hours of sleep. Don't disturb me under any conditions. And so I got, went to sleep. 
and I don't know it was an hour or two later, Lieutenant, Lieutenant, they're dropping mortars on our tent. I said, dropping mortars? <laughs> that woke me up. He said, yeah, but they're not exploding. <laughs> so I got up, I looked. There, the, they were our mortars that had been captured by the Chinese, but they weren't taking the pin out so that they wouldn't arm. So we had three of them in the tent, you know, fully low, but just hadn't pulled the pin. Any one of them would have wiped us all out. So that's just how, you know, how it is. He <laughs> said. So I looked down. I said, "Don't touch them." Went back to bed. I'll take care of them later. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of, the, you know, the. <laughs> so, and so another thing about being EOD, when the troops got ready to leave, there was still lots of things had to be destroyed, especially ammunition, and so we were the very last after everybody left. Then we would set off the, the charges to destroy everything. And so we were sometimes, the, the Chinese were practically in our backyard. I mean, we could see them, they were coming over the hills. As soon as they saw the main troops were drawing, and of course they, so that happened three different times. And so fortunately our jet, Jeep kept running. <laughs> so, so we would have to go to each one and blow it up and, you know, to set the primer and go. So uh, that was kind of, uh, <laughs> what should we say? Exciting. <laughs> so too, I've been very fortunate. Too much really. thrill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to backtrack a little bit, um, sure. how did your family feel about you leaving to Korea? Well, it's just one of the, we married for, let's see, in 1950, we'd been married six years. And of course, when we were married, it was during World War II. And uh, uh, I told my wife, you know, uh, I know I'll be going overseas again, which she accepted that. And so we were separated a year then. And then, uh, so when Korea came along, well, we're gone. That's all there was to it. We had one daughter at that time. And uh, we had a daughter born in 1946, so she was about four years old. And uh, then we had a second daughter in 52, so we had two girls. So. Uh, you just become, you know, when you're, at that time we were living in the, on the base, so you're with the, the Marines, yeah, you know, with your people all the time, so you become part, you become very close. We still have some that are still living that we're in contact with and, and stay in contact with. So you develop a very strong relationship and, you know, the wives support the wives and all afterwards. And so. Uh, there wasn't much they could say. That was, that's the way it was. That's what we were doing. That was our job. Yeah, that was your job. So, uh, then how about you? What did you think about going to Korea to fight? Any different feeling towards it? And then once you got there, what was your impression of? Oh, I, I mean, just as I said, being a Marine, I'd already been in the Marine Corps, <clears throat> see, 12 years at that point. So uh, I was a career Marine, and that's there was no question if we're going, we have to do it. We have to. We've got to stop them. We can't let them overrun the country. So it was just something that if you're a military man in a career, that's it. Now, of course, there were people being drafted then, you know, they had drafted me and uh, they felt probably a lot of them didn't were too, uh, same, you know, the same center as we were, but, but uh, it was what we were paid to do and that's that. There was no question, no, no doubt that we were not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Were you stationed somewhere as well? Oh yeah, well at the time the 1st Division, 1st Marine Division was here at Pendleton. Mm -hmm. In so, Korea? Oh, in Korea. Well, we were on the go all the time. You were never stationed in any one place. You were constantly moving, 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 you see. Uh, there was never any stable. Now there were rear echelon people, as we call them, were the supplies, and they were the Spies, but they still would move up. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I was always right up behind the infantry, so it would be available to take care of the duds and so forth. Uh, I could tell a lot of stories about different incidents about the duds, whether you want me to mention that or not. If you'd like. Okay, to. well, there's a bomb called the butterfly bomb, and when they're dropped, they're small bombs, they only look like a grenade, hand grenade, and no outside, just round and green. And so the Air Force uh, dropped uh, quite a, a large quantity of these butterfly bombs 
in an area where the Marine Corps was coming in and setting up 10 days later. Well, what the butterfly bomb is, is four different ones. One detonate upon impact. One has an impact of, of time or anywhere from 24 to 72 hours delay, then they, then they explode. The third one, uh, the third one is, is what they call the anti-disturbance. I've said, actually there's you know three, three not four, but different timers. They lay there and sit there until touched and they explode. So they're very, very treacherous. So we were able, we, we had about a week, I think it was, to, to go through the area. They had the area pretty well wrecked, but, where, but it was a large area. And it was where there were houses and people. Of course, no one was living there then. So uh, we were able to get about 12 men together from the engineers and my squad. And we had to go out and individually set a charge each next to each one of them without touching them and then set off the thing and move. You know, we'd do it together. We'd do four or five and then we'd pull back. So we destroyed over 600, we know, with no casualties. And so that was, but during the night, even though the area was ripped off, some of the people who had returned to their area would sneak into their area and you'd hear explosion. The next day you'd find them dead. It'd blow the legs off, they bleed to death. So we lost civilians that weren't supposed to do it, but they wanted to get to the house. So after two or three days, it sort of tapered off. But at first we had quite a few sneak in at night. There's, you know, no way of keeping them out in the middle of the night. So um, then the interesting thing of that was about a week later, I got a call from the fellow who notified me what, where to go. He said, I think we found another butterfly bomb. And it had rained, and after the rain, you know, the dust that covers them up. So I went back, and wh where was it? Lo and behold, it was right in the middle of where, what we call our CP, where we'd been operating. Now, whether it was just plain dud or whether it was, never touched. So I destroyed that one. But thinking about, been walking all around that area all that time. So uh, it's one of the game, you know, <laughs> could have killed somebody. So that's pretty well uh, after Chosen. Then we turned around and went back up for, I was there, say, for until June of 51. Mm -hmm. I, came back to the States and, and uh, went back to ordinance school again and teaching. So when you came back home from Korea, that's where you went? Yeah, yeah, went to, uh, no, I take it back, take it back. Came back to Pendleton, you know. mm -hmm. <laughs> it was ordinance school after World War II. Came back to Camp Pendleton. My wife had stayed here and uh, actually I'd signed papers on a house to have it built. So she stayed here and had it built and so we moved into a brand new house and so uh, that worked out just fine. Uh, it was right in Oceanside, and, uh, which is you know, close to it. And so then uh, a few years later, we were transferred back east. And uh, so we were back and forth, uh, east coast and west coast. And uh, so uh, we spent a lot of time at Camp Pendleton. And uh, basically uh, in 19, my life was promoted uh, then uh, I came back from from the ordinance school while I was back east teaching at the Navy. There's only one school that teaches EOD and all the services attend that. Well, I was on the staff teaching and a friend of mine said, you know, you ought to get, a, you ought to get your degree, Vic. I said, well, how do you do that? He said, the, the University of Maryland have teachers all over here and you can go at night. So I said, fine. So I was there for four years. I went to school, I worked all day, went to school four nights a week for four years and graduated. So I got my degree and then, then came back to Pendleton because I knew that's where I was going to retire and that's where we were going to settle, no doubt about California being the you know, best climate in the world. And I liked everything about it, you know, compared to the East Coast where it's humid and cold cold in the winter, hot in the summer. So anyway, uh, by 1960, I was long overdue to go overseas again. And peacetime, you go overseas, of course, to 
They should to go to Okinawa, where we had, the Marine Corps had a large, uh, a large uh, division. And uh, but you're there for 13 months. You couldn't have your family with you. And I just didn't feel like I wanted another separation. We'd already had three, so uh, I decided to retire as a major. I was only 40 years old, and I did agree, and so I did. So I never regretted. If I had stayed in, I would have been involved with Vietnam, of course. So. Uh, so when, that's when I retired, 1960, and, and uh, that's, that's my military career. <laughs> if I could ask you a little bit more about uh, Korea, what were, you said you weren't stationed, you guys were always on the go. That's right. Uh, but awesome. still, what were the conditions like, uh, the living conditions, and what, what, were you, what were your impressions? What did you see in what was that like? Well, my impressions, of course, was uh, the, the the very, very the pathetic suffering of the people, especially coming down, even during, uh, before before the Chosen Reservoir, the families moving, you know, they were displaced, and they'd have families and they'd carrying them. And uh, one of the most impressive things that I'll never forget was uh, when we were at the, the reservoir, I went out, got up one morning, came out, and uh, we had to keep starting our vehicles. You know, if they didn't run them every two, three hours, you couldn't start them because the oil would freeze up. And so here is a woman sitting there by a stream. She broke the ice with the stream, and she is washing clothes about six o'clock in the morning below zero. And I thought, boy, oh boy, you know, these people are just, they're so clean, they have the cleanliness. Even when they're walking down the roads, they're, they were white, how they stayed that way. And then, of course, with the reservoir, there were literally thousands of them falling right behind us, you know. And so we had to, many times, had to force them back so they didn't get too close. And, of course, you know, after, uh, when, when they, uh, uh, well, said a lot of them were evacuated, of course. And, uh, we, and you know, when we left the... Uh, from uh, Hung Nam, there were thousands evacuated and taken with us in several Navy ships, which was, you know, because they were following along, they knew if they, Chinese probably would have killed most of them or raped them, whatever. And I saw cases of really where women had been raped and just left. Really, that, you know, that was stressful. But I admired the, the uh, you know, just how, strong they were to do what they did, walking, 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 cold weather. How much did they have to eat? It was just, uh, I was very impressed with the, with the civilians, how they managed and, and uh, you know, you never heard them. And sometimes, you know, they were close, close to us uh, when we were staying. Sometimes we came back for a few days, wouldn't be on constantly, but some, once in a while I was forced to come back and rest. You can't work seven days a week and, you know, 18 hours. So my squad and I were forced to come back and just take care of things for a week. And, and uh, of course, then we had, you know, had the civilians around. And I don't even remember the name of the town it was. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, that was my impression of them. I really admired the people. Did you also have interactions with the South Korean Army? Like no. Katusa. Well, they, they they were on both sides of us, so. and uh, we were. I'll be very honest. We were happy to have the Koreans on our flanks rather than the U.S. Army, because the U.S. Army uh, the expression was "bug out itis." They were always looking how they can get out, retreat. And one incident in Korea and uh, at the chosen well, it was down when we Kota Re was the next stop down, and. Uh, very famous Marine Chesty Puller. Uh, he was the, the uh, regimental commander, and he had army under him. And so when they came, he said, "You can hear and there and there, and the Marines behind you. If anyone thinks about retreating, you know what's going to happen. There's no retreating. Period." So, but that was the army. They they would just break ranks and sometimes leave their weapons, just take off. And of course, that exposed, if, if they were on your flank, that exposed your flank and made it more dangerous. So, uh, 
many times the army didn't make a very good, you know, they just didn't stand and fight. And sometimes they were just completely surrounded. There were two battalions came up on our flank at the Chosen Reservoir. They were mechanized, they had all, everything was mechanized. The tanks and they had artillery and had everything, but uh, no walking, everything was like, you know. And yet, they were caught, surrounded, and they were just overwhelmed and ceased being a fighting off two battalions. They came out in the ice in the reservoir and they kept coming through our lines, frozen feet, you know, they went into sleeping bags and get overtaken, bare feet, bare hands, and it doesn't take long to get the frostbite. And uh, one of our uh, colonel who was in charge of the transportation, he actually drove trucks out onto the reservoir ice, knowing whether it's going to take it or not to rescue these fellows. Like some of them just, you know, they couldn't walk anymore. So he rescued three or four hundred. So well, that's, you know, a condition which it's a matter of training and so <laughs> that's why the Marines, yeah. you know, they just, they just don't leave and run, leave equipment or anything like that. So uh, the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You already mentioned a lot of the memories that you had during the duty. Um, anything else most challenging, most difficult, or um, maybe some happy memories, most rewarding memories that you have? <laughs> happy memories. Well, I would say uh, a tour of duty after World War II. Um, as I said, my wife came out to, to Hawaii, came out by civilian transportation, and we were only there about four months, and that was great. It was just like a you know, holiday, and I, it was, I was working just on the, you know, the normal duties, collecting things and, and ordnance, so but there was no, nothing has the war was over. But we were only there four months, and uh, uh, my wife wanted to become pregnant, and I had a jeep. She said, well, I don't want to ride in a jeep. I may not be able to get pregnant. So, so I actually bought a Packard, a 37 Packard convertible, which was a really sporty car. And so we had that. And when I got orders to come back, we sh they shipped it back for us, and, uh, back to San Francisco. And uh, no, we came into San Francisco and then the, 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 the uh, car came into uh, Los Angeles and we brought a dog back with us too. And he came back on, my, on a civilian ship. <laughs> So uh, that was a lot of fun, and of course, a three-year tour in Quantico, it'd be 46 to 49, was just like living in a, well, ideal. You know, you, in the morning we'd go horseback riding, in the afternoon we'd go sailing, at weekends we'd have parties, and it was just, just wonderful. And we were about 35 miles from Washington, D.C., so you know, you're able to go there and do that. So it was just an ideal, and it was a wonderful three-year tour. And of course, uh, lots and lots and lots of people there all, you know, stayed in. They're all career people, they stay. And many, many of them became generals, and I have four or five close generals. In fact, one just died about three months ago, who uh, became very close because after, after World War II, and I was, we were living in Vista, and uh, I was very active with the Boys and Girls Club, and uh, I was president. And when the general retired, he and his wife, they had never had children. As soon as he came to Vista, I recruited him, you know, got him to be on the board. And uh, we formed a foundation. I, I, I'd gotten a contribution of $50,000 from a couple. And of course, at that time, we were spending everything we got, we needed it. So I felt we have to we have to form a foundation, you know what a foundation is. And so he and I, while I was president, set up the foundation, 50,000. And uh, today, you know, that's, that was 75, 1975, 76. The foundation's over $2 million. And the, uh, the club gets about 60,000 a year from it. So that was a thing that I was <laughs> proud of doing. So it had nothing to do with the service, but what is the foundation called? It's just a the Vista Boys Boys and Girls Club, Boys Club of Vista, of, uh, Vista. Mm -hmm. and so it's the foundation is for the Boys and Girls Club, awesome. completely. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, how about during the war? Um, any favorite memories during the war? 
um, <laughs> worst memories during the war too? Anything more that you well, would like to share? The only thing I can say is one thing that does bother me is when the weather went rainy and rainy and rainy. That was always the only time I'd ever get depressed when I was in that kind of weather. You just sit in the tent and and hear that rain, and to me that was depressing. Mm. That's the only time I'd ever get depressed. I'm a pretty positive person and not a worrier, but I would notice that. But I just beg for that sun to come out. There are times when you know you just you don't have the sun, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, the weather, that's one thing, and uh, but I can't say uh, the separations, of course, but you know, when you're at war, you're, you're, you're involved completely with that, but peacetime separations are difficult. The time goes very slowly. And Thirteen months is a long time. That's why I retired in 1960, where I could have stayed. I had 22 years in that, so I could have stayed for another eight years and would have made Colonel, I'm sure, but I just didn't want another 13 month separation. So that was the main thing and I, was, I never regretted that. So uh, in fact, the general I knew very well and served with in Korea and Quantico, he became in charge of a personnel in the headquarters of Marine Corps and he wrote me a letter. He said, Vic, I re we really need people like you who got out early. I can guarantee you, Colonel, if you come back. Well, that was a year later. I, I just, thanks a lot, General. I appreciate it, but you know, I'm situated. I have a job. I like it, and have a house. So, thanks, but no thanks. So, if I'd have gone, of course, then I'd have gotten involved with Vietnam. So it was a good decision that I made, and the time I was so fortunate, and I really was fortunate, and and because uh, I had people shot right next to me in Korea. I mean more than once, right next to me. The last night, the night before the, the final down, uh, they had an ambush and we were waiting, fighting going on, and this friend of mine who was a Mustang, Mustang meaning you become an officer as enlisted, that's, do you know that expression, Mustang? You're enlisted and become an, an officer, that's, you're a Mustang. And so he was a captain and he had 29 years and six months we were lying there side to side, I'm as close as I am to you. And he said, you know, I already have orders. When I get down, get out, I'm on my way back, 29 and 6. About 10 minutes later, I just heard, boom, took one in the head and he was gone just like that. As close as I am sitting you. And that's hard to take, think, is that close to going, been through a lot, obviously World War II and of course World War Korea. Mm -hmm. So there are things that, that you never forget. They live with you every day. Yeah. I have a picture of our battalion, parachute battalion, before we went overseas in 40, early 42. And um, I look at it every day. And, you know, you become very close when you're, every day you're with people. And uh, uh, later on, there was a book written by a young man who called, and there were 23 of us left from that battalion. And so we, you know, a part of the book it's called The Battalion of the Dam by James Christ. And uh, anyway, uh, what should I say? <laughs> uh, there were four of us here in, in the San Diego area. And when they had the book signing, they were all here. Since then, two of them have gone. So uh, I talk to James every once in a while and he keeps in where There's probably less than 15 of us left from this original 400, so I figure I'm really a, <laughs> a survivor. And I think God has been with me so many times. You know, when somebody gets killed right next to you, you're, it makes you think, well, you know. So that's why when I became full-time civilian, I spent lots of time in, you know, in, in contributing uh, community work, like working with Boys and Girls Club and Kiwanis and all kinds of things. So trying to repay for what? <laughs> my f good fortune. Yeah. So just living to be 94 is a pretty good fortune too. Yeah. <laughs> so that basically would be it I'd say. And you came out of Korea after the Chosen Reservoir? Yeah. Okay. Ten months and came back, you know, rotated. And I came back to Pendleton as I said. And I was there for three years. 
-hmm. when you came out of Korea, was it on that boat that also had a lot of refugees come out? No, no. That, that was just when we were evacuated from Hung Nam and taken back to Maison. She went all the way back south. That was that. But this was in June of 1950, you see. Mm -hmm. 51. June yeah. 51, yeah. So uh, it was just uh, a year after the... It had been exactly a year, but as I said, I was over actually in Korea 10 months. So... Uh, And I had a good job here in Pendleton and really enjoyed it. And had our own house and had another daughter, and so uh, everything was great. Yeah. <laughs> when you were in Korea, did you also encounter foreign troops? Foreign? Allies? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes and no. Um, there were areas where I had to go in and dispose of bombs and so forth, and uh, the Turkish troops really impressed me. They. I could tell from what had happened and how many dead people there were and all, and you can tell by the thing that they were really, really fighters. I mean, in fact, the records that after people were uh, taken captive, and lots of them, you know, just sort of broke down and told everything, the Turkish didn't lose a single man, none of them. They were strong enough to survive and stayed together, so it said something special about about them, and uh, that was one, and of course, uh, uh, that, I don't know about anyone else, it uh, was really outstanding in the case of that, so. Okay. Do you have any, um, towards the opposition, do you have any animosity, like negative thoughts or feelings about the war that took place, Korean no. War? No, it was necessary, I mean, let's face it, if we had let the North Koreans take over, there wouldn't be a South Korea. I mean, we're really happy and <laughs> proud that we did it, even though we lost 33,000 killed. So it was, look what you have now. But I've always admired how, how very supportive the people have continued to do. After 60 years, it's still uh, doing, you know, last year they had a wonderful a group of, of um, actors, actresses came here over in Escondido and put on a beautiful show. I still have the folder on. It's just very impressive. And so the fact that you could go back, you know, on that, still doing that, uh, we, my wife and I decided we just didn't want to do it to, uh, that long a trip. We'd travel all over the world and, and we just didn't feel that going back to a big city and all, even though they wine and dine you and all, but we just never took... My brother, I had a half-brother who was also in the Marine Corps the same time I was, and he and his wife did go back and they treated wonderfully. And it's still available. There's still, I think it's $450 to pay for your airfare and everything else was... And they come back with all kinds of gifts. And right. So, so it's, it's, uh, it says something very positive for you people. Really, I really respect it. So you haven't been to Korea after, right? You said no, you no, I have not. I'd say, even though we had the opportunity, we just decided that, uh, well, to go back to big cities and all, sure, you know, it's not, it wouldn't have been the same as it was during World War II, and, uh, I mean, during Korea, so uh, it was not, we just didn't, uh, plus it was always in the summer, well, you know, July, it's pretty hot. <laughs> we don't particularly enjoy, you know, that type of thing, and it's a long Long flight, and we had traveled a great deal all over the world, and Russia and Australia, and, and you know just about everywhere except China and and uh, India is about the only two countries we hadn't gone to. So we'd done plenty of traveling, and we decided not to do that. Our my other half brother and his wife tried to get us to go with them. I said, "Oh, thanks, but no thanks." <laughs> they hadn't traveled very much, and whereas we had. We would travel a great deal, especially after I retired. I retired the second time in 1982. I worked with a savings and loan for 22 years. I was a manager of an office for 16 of the 22 years. And I also taught, uh, I was a real estate appraiser. I taught real estate appraising uh, at the Palomar College for 20 years. So I enjoyed teaching. That's what I was going to do before I was offered this job. I was going to get my master's and teach at uh, El College, so, 
So everything worked out pretty well. <laughs> so. Of course, um, you're, ta you t you're telling me about the uh, Korean War stories right now. You go meet with the chosen few members. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you still think about the Korean War. Oh, sure. How, how often and how much do you think about it? Well, I'll tell you, I, I have to say that I think more about World War II because I was with this battalion, small battalion. I have a picture of them on my wall. And every day I see them, I never, you know, all the ones who have been killed and died. Uh, so every day I, I never, uh, you know, I always think about them. I think about Korea too because we did have one case where I had a sergeant that uh, made a big mistake and he and two other men were killed. He did something he shouldn't have done. He picked up a bunch of Chinese grenades, which you don't do the way he knew how to do it, but he was sloppy. And I usually never left him alone, but in this case, the CO, the commanding officer of the, of the battalion, I came back from doing the deal. He said, I want to talk to you, Vic. And I said, well, I have some more grenades to pick up. And he said, well, Sergeant Marshall, he's qualified. So I said, okay, Colonel. Well, Sergeant Marshall knew the way we did it, they put them in the great big rice sacks the infantry would do. And fortunately, they did it without, you see, too many of them. If you, the, the Chinese grenade is a handle, and you take the cap off, and then it's a friction. So if you have the handle out and the wires, it only takes two or three of them together, and then the whole thing goes up. Well, that's exactly what happened. He went out and picked up the whole bag, put them in the truck, came back to the drop-off place, the driver who had been with me, and another one helped him, blew up. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt really badly about that. Of course, they all, he died also, he blew his legs off. And, and, uh, but the colonel insists he wanted to talk to me, you see. And I should have over, you know, even though you can only, he knew the right way, but he's lazy. So uh, you just don't do that EOD. You, don't, you make one mistake and that's it. <laughs> so, but I always, you know, it's something I never forget because I felt partially responsible. But uh, when you have orders, I want to see you, I want to talk to you. He's qualified, so I'm going to do it. So <laughs> cases like that, you, you know, you never forget, but there's nothing you can do about it. But those things never leave you. They're with you for life. You know? Many, many others. People killed right beside you. Yeah. You know, and friends who said they were close friends, many, many close friends from the parachute battalion during World War II. Mm -hmm. How do you think you can best describe this legacy of the Korean War veterans? <laughs> well, a legacy. All I can say is I did my job. That's what it's all about. <laughs> you know, so it's just like these fellows are getting medals of honor, and, and most of them say, you know, I'm not really the hero. The ones who are, didn't come home are the heroes, and that's the way I felt. You know, I got the bronze star of being in uh, Korea, and uh, and then with uh, being the division three times, it's a presidential unit citation. That's a special award. I have three of those, and of course I had the Purple Heart. So. Uh, Sorry from that, I mean, I, but uh, I, I agree with them. The ones who, who were killed were the real heroes, regardless of what someone else does. Well, of course, when he throws himself on a grenade and is killed, well, I, I can see getting a Congressional Medal of Honor for that. So, uh, but uh, that's pretty much it. Any other message, special message to um, the future generation that'll be maybe watching this interview someday? Well, what can I say? Uh, I have two grandsons. Uh, neither one of them are very interested in going into the service. And uh, I can honestly say, in my opinion now, that the wars have been fought for the last 10 years, where they've been overseas three and four times, and then being blown off legs and all, I think they are having a tougher time 
than we had in Korea or World War II. I admire those people so much. And they keep volunteering. You know, they, they re-enlist and do it over again. And so, you know, sooner or later, and of course, the EOD people, like I said, there many of them have been killed, yet they still do it. So I don't know whether I would have another choice to be EOD today under those conditions. No way. I just said no. No, enough's enough. But when I was EOD, they had booby traps, but there was no, not, not the way it is today, and they can't be remotely set off and all that. So even though it was dangerous, if you were careful, why, you know, you pretty well knew what you were doing. But, um, so I think these young men today, I admire them a great deal, who continue to re-enlist and go in the service, you know, Army as well as the Marine Corps, or the Navy and the Air Force, of course, they're not, you know, under the same conditions, except the Navy corpsmen. Navy corpsmen are just like Marines, they're there, and when one's wounded, they come up and, you know, when I was wounded, we were getting fire all over, and I had another fellow killed right next to me. He was right there, you know, taking care of me. So they exposed themselves, so they were heroes. The Navy corpsman, I think. We had one in the Chosen Few chapter here, he died about a year ago. And uh, so, that's about it. Looking at the big picture, I think our younger generation today based on the world conditions and the present <laughs> political situation, are going to have a tough, tough time. I really do. I mean, 17 trillion in debt and going on and on and on. It just isn't going to. And then, of course, our, you know, the, the people coming across the border now is really serious. I mean, once they get here, you know, we support them. They get free medical, they get free everything. So it's very, very serious. That's where the big problems are right now. Uh, hopefully the wars are over and, of course, you know, look at Iraq. <laughs> we fought there for eight, nine years and now it's starting to fall apart all over again. So that, that I think that if somebody, families who had them over there were killed over there and now they see what's happening, that can be pretty stressful. Whereas with us in Korea and World War II, it was for a reason, and it you know it, it, it worked out. We had to do it, and so. Uh, but this uh, continuing war now, or just uh, there's nothing glamorous about war. If anybody tries to say it is. It's they haven't been through the real war. <laughs> That's the best I can say.